good afternoon and uh, soon we say good evening, but uh, it's still late afternoon. And uh, I will just keep you busy a little bit in the best sense and uh, we'll entertain you with a very interesting scientific program uh, in the next one hour or so. <coughs> and uh, this is my great uh, pleasure and privilege to invite you in this uh, important uh, scientific symposium organized by Evan Pharma. And uh, everybody uh, knows that uh, Evan Pharma is a very international based company and uh, they are focused their, uh, <coughs> let's say, uh, uh, research. Thank you very much, and uh, I would like to, to hand over to, to Hali to briefly introduce my talk and then to go ahead. Thank you. This is really an honor to uh, co share this session on the drug cerebralizing and together with Dafin Murasan because he introduced me to this drug in 2006. I was very much surprised <coughs> to know what kind of this drug is and in fact initially I was thinking what it can do but when I started our research we find very new ideas and that is also recognized at several key places. So I am very grateful to Dasim for introducing this compound and now I will uh, do not delay uh, asking Dasim to discuss about the concept of multimodal drugs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali, and uh, this is my 
my great pleasure to open briefly because I decided to have just a brief opening, leaving more, more uh, uh, time and space for this eminent uh, uh, colleagues, friends, and uh, scientists to entertain further on. Uh, the idea is that uh, sometime more than 20 years ago, I started to, to be extremely interested by my neurotrophic factors, so I had a chance to conclude my PhD and also to work uh, in different uh, uh, groups uh, all over the world with trophic factors, and uh, this is really my, uh, my hobby, uh, brain protection and recovery, and uh, I think, uh, as I said yesterday, and it's not only my opinion, I think that the future belongs to biological drugs, at least in respect to brain protection and recovery. And what I'd like to, to, to briefly review, because yesterday we had a chance to present some of these aspects, and particularly the concept of multimodality and the multimodal drug. And uh, uh, today I'm just trying to recall these aspects, and then I see you in the fair using the uh, trophic factors basically the ceremony. <laughs> well, thank you, Tafel, and again, I'm very grateful to be here. My talk was curtailed by 70%, so I will do whatever I can show you here. Of course, we still do not know anything about cerebralizing. We have much to do. And since Tafel has made these things very clear, what we are doing is that we try to uh, develop the drug delivery using nanowires. And this is uh, the nanowires uh, done by my colleague, Dr. Ryan Tian. And I must show the pictures because I am grateful to uh, Dr. Tian and Bang, who has uh, done this work on nanowiring in the University of Arkansas, Fayetteville. I also show some pictures because without the support of Arkansas government, this is very difficult to continue the work. And obviously, this is the uh, education minister and research minister in Sweden who has given us unrestricted funds to work on because these are very expensive uh, investigations. And obviously, uh, we got lots of support from the government of India when he was, uh, Dr. Kalam was uh, president of India. So here I should say that sometimes science and politics do meet if the politicians are educated. Well, we always test our hypothesis that whether we are doing wrong or right. There are several ways. Use the same drug by different independent investigators. Give them and don't talk. Use different models, either brain injury or different times, and see what happens. And of course, testing your hypothesis at uh, important meeting in United States. So we just said something with Society for Neuroscience, and we are very happy that our results on not only cerebral license, but nano drug delivery was always taken as nano symposium. And usually it is shared by me. So uh, I was impressed. But uh, when I got this invitation from National Innovation uh, Summit 2013, we were very happy and just said submit something about that. Then I just said several. We have many drugs that is we are delivering nano uh, drug delivery. We have given this project to them and we are very surprised because it is written that only top you know, uh, investigators will be asked to present their result. And I believe I am not among them. But we are very surprised that we are invited to present this talk. So just showing you again. And this, this is just, uh, I am very happy to see Cerebralizing in this innovation summit. And I can, cannot read it, but we have my colleague from Ryan Chiang, his partner, and my university, Banarasan University. And uh, I will not take your time so much, but I will just show you something very brief. So, there are different sets of investigations I am showing you. And we just did recently in Las Vegas, there was a conference on ubiquity, and this was the, uh, Dr. Aaron Chitanova was the Nobel Prize winner on this subject. So we submitted an abstract there. And to our utter surprise, our abstract was selected three, one of the three exemplary abstracts. I mean, I cannot ask more. So I will show you some results about how cerebralizing has modified ubiquity. People believe that uh, ubiquity and overexpression uh, could be injurious to the nerve cell, and it is still very primitive. And this is not my result, but we can see that 
cubic fifteen over expression can be found in Parkinson disease, Alzheimer's disease, and many other things. But still, there is a problem that whether it is helping them or it is for bad. You can also see that even uh, viral vectors infections and they are cubic fifteen can be expressed anywhere. I have no time. I should run. The point is that we wanted to study that what will happen under situations of nanoparticles. Can nanoparticles influence cubic fifteen expression? This is also not my work. This was published recently in Nature. And they say that uh, UV protein can be modulated by gold nanoparticles. These are some examples of how it can uh, penetrate to the membrane and affect the UV protein formation. So, we know that all kinds of nanoparticles produce oxidative stress and UV protein can help them. And there is also the relationship between heat shock protein. So, well, this is the protocol we wanted to study silica and uh, hypothermia. And regional expression of humic protein, that was the new in that uh, work. And this is the heat chamber that we use for hypothermia and again uh, nanowiring. Since I have very less time, we should focus on these uh, last three bar diagrams. This is uh, showing uh, silica exposure increase of humic protein in reactivity. This is normal, this is hypothermia, and this is silica, and it was added, expression is much more. In normal cases, this cerebrolysin was injected, this has reduced. But the normal cerebralizing in silica exposure did not reduce. But when we have given nano delivery of cerebralizing, this is significantly reduced. And this is true for last three bar diagrams in different areas of brain. Well, what will happen? What relationship it can have? So this is, we are measuring uh, regional neuronal damage. I can also uh, tell you to concentrate only these three last bar diagrams, telling that cerebralizing in normal animals can protect, but adding silica did not, and nanowire cerebralizing did the best work so far in our hand, and this is in different regional cases. There was a tight correlation between damaging of the brain and uh, increased permeability or cubic protein expression. So we believe that they are somehow related. Now I'm showing briefly some examples. This is the cubic protein expression for our heat stress is much more than control. Silica has increased much more. Normal cerebralizing, and with these two are normal cerebralizing here in normal animals, try to suppress it. In silica, I did nothing, but nanowire cerebralizing did much better work than others. The same thing is happening with neuronal damages. As you can see, that adding silica uh, is much more disastrous, and cerebralizing in silica did not do much better, but nanowire did much better than uh, the cerebralizing alone. So we can only say here that uh, cerebralizing has the capacity to reduce the neuronal damages, but it is much more effective when it is delivered by nanowire cerebralizing. I do not have time to detail more things. Then, if this is so, let us have independent evaluation in different laboratories with where we do not have any control. So here is uh, Dr. Morrison who tried to understand the mechanisms. In hyperthermia, no silica was added, and one of the oxygen radical or uh, oxidative stress is produced by nitric oxide synthase, both uh, basic and constitutive type. So let us see what is happening. And we are always fascinated with uh, BDNF, GDNF, and always fascinated by Dr. Uh, Reisman here, and also Martin Schwab from Switzerland. I have a bad luck that I was not able to work in any place I wanted, but uh, that's the story. So we did this work. And here, this is a complex uh, diagram, but you should see here this is not a disruption. You should focus here that after four hours, this is the normal cerebralizing, it is used in normal animals. When it is added, uh, after 30 minutes, uh, even high dose did this work. But when we have nanowire cerebralizing in 2.5 milliliter, after 30 minutes, the result was the best, and also at higher doses. Interestingly, even 90 minutes after, nanowire cerebralizing is doing better, but not the normal cerebralizing. So it has done something. You could also see this is uh, brain edema and the pictures are very similar. I do not have time much to tell, but the point is that nanowire cerebralizing always works than the normal cerebralizing given 30 minutes off. And this is also neuronal damages. This picture is very same. Now look at these pictures. This is nanowire cerebralizing after 30 minutes and reduction in uh, neuronal injury and uh, nanowire cerebralizing after 60 minutes. So even after 60 minutes, even we can see some cell damage, but it's largely protected, which is 
not seen in normal cerebralizing cases. And these are uh, neuronal norms after 30 minutes of cerebralizing uh, and even 60 minutes, there was much less uh, expression of nitroxide in the base and not showing in this but that is also worked in this way. So we believe that probably oxidative stress plays an important role and this drug when it is given in right time and in right dose, probably uh, enhanced by nanowire, it can produce. Now, the third is, and this work was chosen by National Innovation Summit. So we went to China and uh, tried to do, they have a lot of work on uh, peripheral neuronal injury. We also, being a surgical sciences department of anesthesiology, we have great interest. So we said that let us work with Dr. So, And we have done a lot of work, and this was also our surprise. So what we do, do that uh, we have either peripheral nerve lesion or uh, transaction. And then after a certain time period, we see a spinal cord leakage. The first paper we published in 2000 in pain, showing that permeability to albumin is increased. And then we have interest in activation of astrocytes. We have so far not uh, studied the microglia activation, that is quite common, one should study. And then uh, it should be uh, examined by administration of nanoparticles. The cause of peripheral nerve injury, together working with the um, uh, force research laboratory, I mean, uh, it is an open fact that uh, our soldiers are injured in the battlefield and they have different kinds of uh, neuropathic pain of different identity and they are also exposed to different kinds of nanoparticles. So this is the first experiment that we did and in this case, our interest was copper, silver and for aluminum, but I, I will not go into detail. Here you should look at that there are three different uh, lesions of the spinal cord, T10, T12, and L5. The lesion was done on L4 and L5. And then there are different time points. And you should see that this is albumin leakage that is increasing over time. This is 10 weeks. And uh, 4, 8, and 10 weeks perhaps. So 10 weeks is the highest one. So there is albumin leakage. And this is a simple example that the leakage is increasing. And with three different types of nanoparticles, there are three different effects, even they are of the same size. So probably the inherent properties of the nanoparticles are important in this kind of experiment. This is the expression of astrocytes. They are also increasing over time, but three different types of nanoparticles in three different ways. And this is the neural injury in the spinal cord. The result is very similar so far in our hand. The pain perception that is decreased over time, and that, that is quite happened. Uh, as most of you are clinicians, you can understand that the uh, perception of pain can disappear, but the pathology can expect. So this is not an unusual finding. Then here you can see that GFFP in different areas, and when we have uh, this nanoparticle, uh, they are much more exacerbated. And this is also, you can see that nanoparticles almost complete uh, degeneration. Then we have given nanowires that are different protocols, and you can see here that this GFFB was much more reduced and also the albumin leakage is much more contained in those cases where nanowire cerebralizing was given as compared to the normal cases. I'm not showing uh, those things because my time is very little. This is also the same example. So we believe that nanoparticle toxicity also increases neuropathic pain syndrome and morphology and nanowire cerebralizing may have some effect on the other protection. In the last five minutes, Five minutes? Okay. I will show you if our hypothesis is correct, then it should work in different kinds of uh, CNS injury model. And I will be very brief. I will not explain to you this is in Parkinson's disease. This is not my work. This is from uh, Nature Protocol. This is a classical example. And this is also the other work that how uh, the biochemical changes can occur. Here is our work. And GH positive cells, you can see it in, uh, in two areas, uh, and substance in Agra and uh, Stratum, you can see. You should focus on these things. When nanowire cellulizing were given, they, the levels were quite similar to normal cases. Also in substance in Agra and Stratum, these are the cases. <coughs> the same thing ha happens also with, uh, uh, with our mineralogy content here, and you can see that nanowire cellulizing is much more better than the normal. Here we have an open model of injury where brain has uh, some space to grow. And 
restoration, really the treatment of the, not the injury, but the treatment essentially of the impact system to stimulate recovery. We all know 
that this cemetery full of drugs that have been used, attempted to use to treat stroke and traumatic brain injury, neuroprotection. And it's pathetic. Uh, there's been an enormous number of patients, monies, resources used. And there's a naivete in this. People have focused on the lesion. This also a plug for tomorrow's time. People have focused on lesion, reducing the volume of cerebral infarction, reducing damage. That's extremely difficult to do. But what the body does, what the brain does beautifully, is try to remodel itself. Your patients improve in time. No one looks at the what at what the biological substrates of recovery are. And so what we've uh, what I've been doing for the past number of years is trying to understand what is the biological basis? How do we remodel the brain? And what I will present to you uh, in the next few hours <laughs> the work, uh, is just some of the work we've done on, on one of the agents, cerebral lysin. And what, we, what I will describe to you is some of the mechanisms by which cerebral lysin stimulates recovery. And Dr. Finn beautifully presented the concept that of a multimodal drug. And I'm going to move it in a, maybe in a slightly different direction and tell you that what cerebralicin does <coughs> is that it turns on parenchymal cells. And tomorrow I'll describe to you that stem cells do, do the same things. So what happens is that cerebralicin activates endothelial cells and it activates parenchymal cells. When it activates uh, endothelial cells, the endothelial cells then produce certain factors. And I'll briefly describe some of the factors. Then I'm going to ask you a question. How does it do this? What is, how does cerebralicin really communicate? How does it turn on many different processes? And uh, Eventually, I'll actually get to my talk and not simply tell you what I will tell you about. But uh, uh, what I'll tell you is that cerebralicin makes the brain young again. All restorative processes, whether they're pharmacological or cell-based, work by stimulating endogenous developmental processes. We really revert to an earlier stage of development. But we've known this for decades now, that if you have an injury to the brain, the genes in the brain become developmental. And what happens is that agents, restorative agents, activate and amplify these endogenous restorative processes. And I'll tell you that there's one particular process or pathway or transcription factor that I, I'm a bit passionate about. It's called sonic hedgehog. It's a morphogen. A morphogen is an agent that is important in the on the modeling of brain. You have sonic hedgehog in utero that ends up generating your brain. I'll show you that cerebralicin actually stimulates this wonderful morphogen that is present when you're in when you're a fetus, and that then subsequently turns on all these wonderful remodeling processes. Then, if you're not too bored with me, I, I just want to uh, touch on an area that I feel is very understudied. It's the area of mild traumatic brain injury. Now, I won't go into mechanisms uh, of action, but I'll show you that cerebral license has a profound effect on mild traumatic brain injury. What are some examples of mild traumatic brain injury? It's funny stuff. That accumulates, and it's fascinating and, uh, uh, that you can have a mild traumatic brain injury without any evidence at all of morphological, neuropathological change, yet you will get months later dysfunction. And we'll, we'll touch on that. Uh, so uh, first, let's go in. Let's uh, first talk about some issues associated with stroke and demonstrate to you 
some of the processes and molecular pathways that turn on remodeling. Does cerebral ice work <laughs> if I if I have an injury like stroke?